Human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hero. Sally Fallon Morell is the director and co founder of the Weston A. Price Foundation. She spent the last 20 years doing amazing work to promote the wise traditions of our ancestors and their farming, preparation, and consumption of foods. She's written many amazing books such as Nourishing Traditions, Eat Fat, Lose Fat, and a new book called Nourishing Diets. I really value all that she's done and continues to do. I've come to realize my ideal diet is the one the Weston A. Price Foundation recommends minus the grains, even though they are safe if you prepare them properly, as Sally mentions. I prefer to run on fat, and most people listening probably know the vast benefits of doing this. I want to highlight that they can be safe to eat if you soak them overnight, etc., so if you choose to eat these foods, at least do it properly. You may have noticed I'm getting all kinds of people on the show. I don't want to be totally one-sided. I'll let people share their differing opinions and not argue with them. That doesn't mean I support their stance. Dr. David Clerfeld, Lane Norton. Let's hear what they have to say. I think it would be a disservice to just keep getting people on the show who 100% agree with me. You have to be open to all sides so you're not caught being dogmatic, just like vegans, and only look at things from one angle or miss the truth because your head is in the sand. All I'm after is truth and will change my views if necessary. So far, nothing has shaken my belief that we need to eat nutrient-dense ancestral diets with a lot of animal fat. I believe it's better to run on fat and most carbs are pretty worthless because they don't have a lot of nutrients for how much energy they have. You can get the same nutrients that properly sprouted and fermented grains have elsewhere. People doing carnivore, listen to the teachings of Dr. Price. Eat the whole animal. So much of the good stuff is in the bits and pieces. You can point to many populations over time eating mostly all or even 100% animal foods for long periods of life, and I agree with you, but they weren't eating only muscle meat. I think the best diet out there is basically what Tara Couture, my last podcast guest who's a homestead farmer, feeds her family. The full animal plus fermented veg and other fresh grown veg thrown in. Add in some more exotic foods such as fish eggs, avocado, mushrooms, and coconut oil. You can't get more nutrient dense and less potentially harmful than that. This was our last film tour and we're now actively engaged in post-production for Food Lies. All the t-shirts and rewards are being sent out shortly. You can still pre-order the film and get the other rewards at Indiegogo.com, which is linked here in the show notes and at foodlies.org, where you can also see the film trailer. Thanks so much for the support, and here's Sally. Hello, Sally Fallon Morell. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it was so great to come to your farm and shoot with you. That was only a couple days ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we, we had, had a good time. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, your husband had a tremendous grip. <laughs> He yeah. has very strong handshake. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's an older guy, but he's yeah. still. Yeah, he's still out there. On, he's out there on the tractor right now. He's he's amazing. He has more energy than I do. That's awesome. Yeah. So it was so cool. We got to see. You have cows, uh, pigs, cows, chickens, pigs, chickens, turkeys, a couple of geese, a couple That's of so very great. noisy geese. <laughs> and then you're making cheese. What else are you doing out there? So our centerpiece is cheese. We have a um, small dairy herd that is pasture fed. We make raw cheese. We also sell raw milk. We label it as we have to label it as pet milk. And huh. the whey from the cheese helps feed our pigs. We have pigs in the woods that's completely natural. And our feed mix doesn't use any corn or soy or GMOs. And then we also have chickens on pasture right now. Well, you just saw the layers, but in the warmer months, we have meat birds and we have some turkeys right now. So everything kind of fits together as a puzzle. Uh, each animal species has a job to do on the farm and kind of fits in with all the other species. That's so great. It's how nature meant it, right? Yeah, we, yes. Yeah. We, we like to say we're using technology not to dominate nature and not to impose our views on nature, but to to imitate nature. So in nature, you know, animals are never still. They're always moving. They never stay in one place. So we use movable electric fencing. Uh, this is Joel Salatin style to move our animals every day. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw the movable chickens and then you had the cows with the sort of a rotational grazing. Right, exactly. Now, this time of year, we don't have a lot of pasture, so we actually give them a lot more space than we'd normally give them. And we might keep them in one place for two or three days 
But in the spring, when the grass starts growing, uh, we often move them twice a day to mm. new pasture. Yeah, and keep them really close, like mob intensive. Grazing. Exactly. We have a small area and the cows are crowded, but you have to stay on top of it because they eat really fast. Uh-huh. <laughs> and pretty soon where, where they are, it looks like it's just a lawn, like it's been mowed. And then you have to move them or they will get hungry. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so much to talk about with you. It was so great. We just got you on camera and it was just pure gold. Everything you said. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I loved it uh, when you took pictures of me in the pig pen, uh, crouching down with the pigs. (laughs) And you know, the interesting thing about doing pigs this way, um, you're letting pigs be pigs and pigs like to root around in the dirt and uh, they're very sociable creatures. And when you do the pigs this way, uh, there's no smell. Oh yeah. Um, and we were know. we had 20 pigs around us and there was no smell. Yeah, that's how you know it's correct. It's, and you're it's doing right. Correct. Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. I think it's so weird that it's uncommon to do things like this that you have to be the outlier in doing a proper farm and especially with our diet how you had to start a whole organization. <laughs> just to <laughs> tell people how to eat like we've always eaten. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I've often said to my husband, you know, it's really weird that people need somebody to tell them how to cook eggs and make broth and you know, all the things our ancestors need to do. But but first question is going back to the farming. It, I, I have to say that this type of farming that we're doing was not possible until you had electric fencing. Uh, so it's actually technology that's made it possible. In the old days, you had to have shepherds for your cows and sheep, and you had to have your chickens in a pen, and you had to have your pigs in a pen, because, or you just put them in the woods and hope to find them later. But with the electric fencing, that's what allows this old-fashioned type of farming is this new technology. So it's kind of a paradox in a way. And But the, I think the other reason is that Agriculture in America, it, well, it's dominated by the Department of Agriculture, and the mandate for the Department of Agriculture is to sell grain. That's what they're supposed to do is sell grain. So mm-hmm. they do not support anything that doesn't use up a lot of grain. And when you're pasture feeding your cows, you are not buying grain or not a lot of grain. And that there's a definitely disapproval of that. Now, it's such a beautiful system, such a beautiful way of raising your cows. It, it's healthy for the cows, healthy for the soil, it improves the soil, it uses land that wouldn't otherwise be lo- used. And I've heard many stories of, you know, farmers doing this. Maybe somebody who's really enthusiastic about this from the Department of Agriculture will encourage farmers to do this system. But then he hears from on high and his bosses tell him to stop. Uh, I've heard this story many times. Mm. So they are not allowed to encourage farmers to do managed grazing. It's not illegal. It works. Uh, There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing that they can say to tell you to stop doing it. But they don't tell you about it because, you know, it's not their mandate. Their mandate is to sell grain. Yeah, that's too bad. And it's so great that the West Indian Price Foundation, what you guys are doing is using modern science to validate the past. So it's kind of like what you're doing with the grazing. It's like we figured out some new techniques that kind of mimic the past. I mean, I've heard that ruminants are sort of mob animals and they roam and they graze in, in a tight pack to protect themselves against predators way back in the day, way back. Yes, and exactly. That's, and, they not, and they move. They're always moving. And so the electric fences allowed us to do that in a really more efficient way. Yeah, and they- very controlled way. So we have a rotation around the farm and we just move them through that rotation. And then we have to be very observant of the cows. Are they getting enough to eat? Are they, do they have enough for the day or do we have to come back and move them again? So all of that is, is part of the skill in this kind of farming. But yeah. yes, uh, you know, the traditions of our ancestors have been lost. We have I mean, I can remember my mother when I was a little girl saying that broth was good for you, it was good for your skin, and it was good if you got sick to have broth. And so that was a tradition that she remembered. But little by little, these have all uh, f- faded away and people have forgotten. And now we have to come back at this a different way. We can say, yes, this was a tradition. The tradition was that this was good for you, but we just can't rely on tradition. Now we have to validate the tradition with modern science. And so that's what the Weston A. Price Foundation does fundamentally. We're teaching traditional food preparation techniques, uh, how to eat in a traditional way, but we're also showing the science that validates that. 
just so for example you know we've been told all these years that we shouldn't eat saturated fats well this is just the department of agriculture getting people to buy more grains because when they make oils out of grains like soybeans or corn there's not a lot of saturated fat in there and so that was a selling technique to sell grains basically and so here here we come along and we say well our ancestors loved animal fat they that was the part that was most prized that's the saturated fat and we're being told not to eat saturated fat so uh, we now have to show the science that shows that saturated fats are actually the kind of fats that we should be eating the kind of fats that are good for us and a big part of our focus at the Weston A Price Foundation has been on fats and to show people that what they're hearing today about fats is, is just wrong and dangerous uh, and, and not very healthy. Absolutely. And I know you talk about the Procter & Gamble story and just yeah. seed oils. Yeah, right. Well, in those days, uh, it was cottonseed oil. So I think Procter & Gamble started in St. Louis, if I'm not mistaken. So they, it was a big cotton trade. And after they pulled the cotton or picked the cotton, they had these seeds left. And what were they going to do with these seeds? So they crushed them and got an oil out. And they actually figured out how to make this oil hard, like butter or lard. And they made something called Crisco, which stands for crystallized cottonseed oil. And that campaign to sell Crisco began in 1913. We, we have the ads. And they did it by demonizing their competition. And in those days, they didn't have the, the cholesterol argument yet. They, they hadn't advanced that far. But they, they just talked about lard and how sort of vulgar lard was. And it made your house smell um, unclean. Unclean. Yeah. Your food would be greasy if you used lard. And uh, you were more modern if you used Crisco. And your children, I, I, I kid you not, this is what they said, your Crisco, children yeah. would grow up with better characters. Fuse Crisco. So they knew how to push all the buttons of the American housewife of the time who basically wanted to get off the farm and live in the cities in a nice house, nice clean house, and have children that they'd be proud of. And that, those were the buttons that they pushed. Uh, little did they know that if you're eating Crisco instead of lard, you are not uh, able to make uh, sex hormones very well. And yeah, your kids might not be as interested in sex. So maybe that means they have better characters. I don't know. <laughs> it was kind of ironic <laughs> the way they, uh, the way it turned out. Well, yeah, but, there's a lot of unintended consequences. Yeah, uh, Absolutely. Well, and we've, we figured out the Weston A. Price Foundation was founded with the help of Mary Enig, PhD, who was the scientist who to launch the campaign against trans fats, and she was right, and you know now we all know that. We know that Crisco has trans fats in it and that these are really bad for us. So we've shown that, but we still have a lot of work to do because people still think saturated fats are bad and they think the right kinds of fats to use are liquid vegetable oils. And these are actually even worse than the trans fats. They break down into various aldehydes in the body and these cause uncontrolled reactions. They cause heart disease and cancer and growth problems and learning disabilities, immune system problems. I mean, they're just the devil's brew of things to put in our bodies. Yeah, a lot of people think it's one of the leading causes of all our problems. I do. I, I agree with that. I mean, there is a lot of bad things in our food supply today. There's sugar and high fructose corn syrup and all of the horrible additives, MSG. There's the extruded breakfast cereals. All of these are really bad. But to me, the worst thing is the industrial seed oils, whether they're liquid or they've been hardened in some way. Uh, because really the basis of good health is animal fats. And all traditional cultures knew this. They went to great lengths to obtain the animal fats. They never threw those away. They hunted at times of the year when the animals would be the fattest. And that's what they wanted was the fat. If there was a lot of meat, they often just threw the meat away. They didn't want lean meat. They wanted the fat and the organ meats, which are fatty, of course. And we've just completely forgotten that. And um, and again, with the milk, people wanted rich, full-fat milk, or they made butter and cream and just threw the rest of it away or gave it to the pigs. No one in the past ever drank skim milk. Yeah, uh, yeah that was not food that was fit for human beings. But now we think that's what we should give our children. It's criminal. I think you've yeah. said it. It's criminal. It's it is. So it is criminal. And unfortunately, it's innocent children who are paying the price. You know, one child in two today has some kind of disability, often an emotional or mental or learning disability. And that's because children's brains are not being formed properly. 
Children cannot make cholesterol, but they need a lot of cholesterol when they're growing to form the brain and the second brain, which is the gut. And to me, it is just criminal. When you look at the ingredients on infant formula, there is not a single brand of infant formula that contains cholesterol. Not one of them has any animal fat in it. Now, if you buy milk replacer for animals, the third ingredient is animal fat. So they know that mammals like humans and animals need cholesterol to grow properly, but they're not putting it in the formula for human infants. And if the mom is breastfeeding, they tell her to eat a low fat diet, you know, grains and vegetables and stuff. And so she won't have a lot of fat and cholesterol in her milk. And no wonder these children aren't doing well. And no wonder they grow up with all these problems. Yeah. Well, it's very obvious because in all of the native living populations, childbirth was simple. They had long traditions, like six months before they even became pregnant to have a nutritious diet and it was the opposite, right? So talk about that. Uh, Yes. So what Dr. Price found in going all over the world was that most cultures had a period of special feeding before conception, not, you know, not after you got pregnant, but before conception for six months. And these foods were very nutrient dense animal foods. Things like liver, uh, butter from grass-fed animals, fish eggs, fish livers, fish liver oils. And these foods were rich in fat and very high in vitamins A, D, and K, the fat-soluble vitamins that we only get from animal fats. And again, the dietary advice that we're given today is... It's not just wrong, it's genocidal. It's leading to widespread infertility. And this is what keeps us going, is just hoping we can reach some people to turn this around. So we will have a human race, <laughs> in, you know, in the future. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm trying to do with the movie. So I'm so glad we connected because Mm -hmm. the whole film is kind of based around nutrient density and looking to our past and getting these foods back in our diet. And I thought it was so interesting that Price went all over the world and found these commonalities. He went to the Swiss Alps, went to the islands in the middle of nowhere, and they did the same things that was based around this. It's just so- Yeah, they were eating different foods, but they had the same level of nutrients. They may have come from different foods. And these diets were really high high in the fat-soluble vitamins, the vitamins we get only from animal fats. Now, the USDA dietary guidelines tell you that animal fats are empty calories, that there's nothing in them that we need. Oh. And this nothing could be further from the truth. <laughs> It's so hard. Well, yeah. so what did what else did Weston Price do? So I bring up Weston A. Price almost every episode of this podcast. So <laughs> it's great to have well, you. Well, that's good. That shows we've succeeded in making his name a household word, and that's good. But I think a lot of people say Weston Price, but they may not understand what he's all about. He's all about nutrient density. But what I found is, you know, we were the ones who started talking about nutrient density. But then the USDA picked up this phrase, nutrient density, and they said, well, you want to eat nutrient-dense foods, that's fruits and vegetables. Mm. Now, I'm not against fruits and vegetables, but they are not nutrient-dense foods. You know, gram for gram, the meats are 10 to 100 times more nutrient-dense than fruits and vegetables. And the organ meats are, again, another order of magnitude greater in vitamins and minerals and nutrients. So it's just wrong to say that vegetables and fruits are nutrient-dense foods. They're nice foods to have, and they're great vehicles for butter and cream, (laughs) but they're not nutrient-dense. Absolutely not. That's one of my biggest things. I try to talk about that all the time. I do posts on social media about that, trying to show people that it's not nutrient dense. The vegan doctors will make a new version of nutrient density where they somehow penalize for saturated fat and do it some weird way to make kale and spinach the top and yeah. animal foods like yeah, way at the right. bottom. And like, this yeah. is not right. It's not right. No, no. And I think people are very deceived. And unfortunately, the vegans and vegetarians, you know, they're very um, idealistic people. And, you know, they want to do things right. and They want to be healthy, but they're being deceived. They are going to end up with deficiencies in so many nutrients, B12, B6, A, D, K, complete protein, glycine, arachidonic acid, all of these things that we need, especially that our brains need, and they are going to end up deficient. And there were, actually was a survey done in 2014 in the UK, and they found that people who followed the vegan vegetarian lifestyle had more tooth decay, more depression, 
more allergies, more cancer. That was the surprising one. They had more cancer and they needed more health care and they had a lower quality of life than people who ate animal foods. Mm. Now, this is a very important study and people need to know this when they're making a decision about how to eat. And yet I've never seen any newspaper talk about this study. Oh, it's against the yeah the media. The agenda is such a plant based agenda. It's like they would never it is definitely it. the plant based diet. That's what they're talking about. <laughs> plant based diet. <laughs> well, I'm going to highlight that study in the film. That's perfect. Yeah. So you talked about more tooth decay. So, mm -hmm. so tooth health is a very strong indicator of overall health. And Weston Price yes. found it. So tell people a little more about. It. All right. So. First of all, whether or not you're getting cavities, if you get cavities, it's a sign of malnutrition. What prevents us from getting cavities is a diet that's rich in vitamin K, because vitamin K puts calcium and phosphorus into the teeth, supported by vitamins A and D, and lots of calcium and phosphorus in the diet. That's what prevents tooth decay. And of course, avoiding uh, empty foods like sugar and white flour. It's not fluoride. It's not, uh, you know, it's not brushing your teeth. It's your diet. And the other indicator of good health is whether you have enough room in your jaws for your teeth. So as you grew up, did you need braces or did you have naturally st straight teeth? All the traditional cultures that Dr. Price visited, the people didn't need braces. They had naturally straight teeth, beautiful teeth. That is an indication of good nutrition from preconception uh, through pregnancy, uh, you know, to the fetus, and then during the growth period. It's a sign. If you've got the naturally straight teeth, the wide uh, palate, the wide face, that is a sign that uh, you had good nutrition during the period of growth. And that's what we're trying to teach people because once that period of growth is over, you can't go back. <laughs> yeah. You can't reform your body. You can't reform your teeth. But this is so critical and the, to be well-nourished when you're growing. And this is just not what we're doing. And then, of course, we have people with horrendous health problems. And good nutrition can help those health problems. But you're always going to be at a disadvantage if you did not have good nutrition during that period of growth. Yeah, those are the most important years, and we don't talk about it that much. We just, you know, give some prenatal vitamins that probably yeah. aren't bioavailable. But at all. After they find out that you're pregnant, so yeah. So one of the things I like to point out: so you, the fetus starts off as an embryo, and the embryo is composed of stem cells. These are undifferentiated cells, and very early in the process, I think it's you know by day twelve or something, the the stem cells start to get signals. And those signals say, you're going to become a heart cell. You're going to become a lung cell. And, and it starts with the heart. So the heart is what starts to form first. And the signals are telling the stem cells, you become heart cells. Now, what is that signal? That signal is vitamin A. And we get vitamin A from foods like liver, butter, egg yolks, organ meats. And so what the traditional cultures did was for six months before they were pregnant, got pregnant, they ate a lot of those foods. So they built up their vitamin A stores. So they're really replete in vitamin A. And once the pregnancy took place, then you had a lot of vitamin A to give those signals um, because you don't even know you're pregnant till you know, the third or fourth week. And by that time, the embryo is the size of a peppercorn and the heart has already started to form. So let's just say you go, you're six weeks pregnant, you go to the doctor and he says, we're going to take this prenatal vitamin. But it's too late at that point. All of the organs have started to form and, you know, there's critical development that's already taken place. And if your body doesn't have the nourish it, nourishment it needs to do that, um, there's going to be problems. The heart yeah, won't well, form properly or there'll be a miscarriage or, you know, all sorts of things. So that's why you, you can't wait till you're pregnant to start this good diet. I mean, better late than never, you know, it's yeah. always a good idea to have a good diet. But for optimal development, that diet has to start before conception. Absolutely. And all the cultures knew this and did this. They didn't even, they didn't know the science, obviously. No, they, right. They did it. But they just knew. The they knew intuitively. Mm -hmm. We've lost that intuition. We can't reach into the spiritual world and get all our answers anymore. So we have to do it through science, and that's fine. Uh, but let's not pervert the science. Let's do what science is really telling us is the right thing.
Absolutely. And also, I don't believe these prenatal vitamins are bioavailable. You're, they're not the real thing. I mean, you need to get them with fat. You need to get them from the food. Exactly. And, you know, one of the things, they're so obsessed about vitamin A being bad that they don't put vitamin A in the prenatals anymore. They put carotenes. And a lot of people can't even convert those carotenes to vitamin A. So yeah, it needs to come from food. And studies have shown that when you get your vitamin A from food, there's no toxicity, but there is could be toxicity from the synthetic vitamins. So it's, exactly. it's all about food. It's all about food. And so uh, we recommend that to get ready for pregnancy, the man and the woman the woman and the man, I should say, both follow this diet. The quality of the sperm is very much dependent on the diet and that they eat things like liver, butter, egg yolks, seafood, shellfish, bone broth, and raw milk. You know, that's another eyebrow razor. <laughs> and uh, do this to get ready for having a healthy baby. And we've had hundreds of couples who have done this and the results are just amazing. These children are so healthy, smart, strong, happy, attractive. They're the greatest gift that any family could have, and it's worth working for. And, you know, our program, our formula, is just like a formula, really, for a healthy baby. It's not hard, nothing that you have to renounce. You can still eat a lot of wonderful foods doing this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so glad I came upon it. It's almost... I would be devastated if I didn't get this information before I started to think about kids. Yeah, yeah having like a family. A, yeah. So important. And, you know, Weston Price saw so many other correlations that I thought were interesting because you're talking about the facial structure, attractiveness or intelligence or all that stuff. A lot of people don't talk about in the book. He studied youth correction centers and saw how much of them had a deficient diet. Yes. Right? Yes. And he had one program with a school where he they gave them one really good meal a day with beef stew and they got cod liver oil and they got really good grass-fed butter mm -hmm. and they talked about the improvements just you know one child was failing and they started to get a's just just by changing the diet just i think one, one of the yeah. most interesting things that dr price talked about was tuberculosis because he noted that as soon as the displacing foods of modern commerce the sugar and the white flour and the canned foods and the vegetable oils arrived in a community uh, the first thing you saw was rampant tooth decay, and then in the next generation, the narrow faces, the tendency to need braces to have crooked teeth, but also the susceptibility to TB. The mm -hmm. people who've been brought up on their traditional diet with the wide faces had no they didn't get TB. They were not susceptible. But the mm -hmm. next generation was, and he did not think this was from infection. He, he thought it was because the lungs were malformed. There was not enough surface area in the lungs because of lack of uh, nutrition. And so they were susceptible to decay. And then they of course, the microorganisms, bacillus, TB bacillus, just there cleaning up the decay. It's just doing its job. But mm -hmm. he thought the root cause of TB was not infection, not crowded quarters, not bad air, because these people lived in smoky huts and they lived in bad air and didn't get TB. But in the next generation, they did. So he, he thought it was that their lungs were just not robust enough to handle mm -hmm. the stresses of life. Either way, what it is, they're more susceptible. If they're not, yeah, if you're not well formed, at least they're more susceptible right, to right. pathogens and stuff like that. So I thought it was really interesting. I've never seen this or heard about it since that he showed the correlations between, for one, the seasonal patterns of grasses where the butter was yes. concentrated with the most nutrients. Yes. And heart attack. Yes, he did a study sort of later in his career. So he was fascinated by these fat sol soluble vitamins and he tested butter from all over the world at different times of year. He must have, I think he tested 16,000 samples of butter. And sometimes the butter hardly had anything in it. And sometimes it was really high in what he called the fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, and K. And it was high at different times at different parts of the world. For example, in California, the maximum uh, nutrition in the butter was in February because that's when the grasses were green and growing really fast. In Nebraska, the maximum was, you know, in May, May and September. And what he correlated was the levels of vitamins in the butter and the deaths from infection and heart attacks, heart disease in the local hospitals. In every area that he did this, there was an inverse correlation. In other words, when the nutrients were the highest in the butter, 
and remember this is in the 30s, this is when everyone ate butter, they had the lowest levels of uh, illness, including heart disease. But when the vitamins were low in the butter, which would be in the winter and midsummer in most places, so times when the grass is not green, then you had much higher rates of heart attack and infection showing up in the local hospitals. It was a fascinating study and so obviously mean. can't be repeated today. Yeah, I love that. And it, and it changed. Yeah, people say, oh, that's only because, was, you know, everyone gets sick in the winter. But it was different for the different yeah. parts and locations. Right. Like in California, people were healthiest in the winter <laughs> because they had yeah. green grass in the winter. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. And there's another correlation he showed. Again, I mean, these are only correlations. We can't say they're causative, but they're very telling. But between the soil health, he took a, a strip of the soil health where the most uh, fertile soil in America was and looked at all those states and where all the PhDs were born and raised. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, I don't think that was Price's study, but he mentions it in his book. Okay. Yeah, and good. I think, I forget who was doing that study, but they were looking at the level of minerals in the soil and where all the PhDs came from. And they found a correlation, <laughs> well-mineralized soil and very intelligent people. I love that. Mm -hmm. And I'll include that in the show notes. I loaned out my book, My Nutrition Physical mm -hmm. Degeneration, but I suggest everyone read it. It's amazing. And, and by the way, he did talk about giving synthetic vitamins versus natural vitamins. He, he referenced a study from the 1930s where they gave vitamin D2 drops to pregnant women and to babies. Mm -hmm. And... They had calcification of the the fontanelle, the head calcified too soon, and the placenta was calcified. So there was a lot of problems when they just gave the D2. Yeah. But when they were getting natural vitamin D, they, they didn't have those problems. Yeah, that's another good point because vegans always try to find me on social media and attack me. And, <laughs> and, and it's just there's nothing I can really say to them. There's too many details. But these, these are some of the details that they don't really know about or want to know about. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned the vegan vegetarian movement because that gives me a nice segue <laughs> uh -huh. into my latest book, <laughs> oh, yeah. which is called Nourishing Diets. And it's there's a chapter on every major area of the world and what people really ate. And of course, none of these were vegetarian or vegans. They um, valued the animal foods above all other foods. Yeah. But I do have a chapter um, at the end of the book called True Blue Zones. Uh, in which I um, analyze that book, Blue Zones, and his thesis is, or his premise is that in areas where people live a long time, they are eating a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And again, mm -hmm. nothing could be further from the truth. He yeah. actually... I have to say he actually lies about what they were eating, and he also ignores all the studies. There's been a study done in every blue zone, and all of these studies showed that the people who were getting more animal foods and more animal fat uh, lived longer uh, than the people who didn't. So it's just, uh, you know, it's... It's just the opposite of what he says, and and yet I see this uh, book, The Blue Zone, you know, kind of dangled in front of us. You see, you see, we should all be vegetarians, and so we'll live longer. Well, that's not what actually they've actually found in these blue zones. The other th thing that they, it's just kind of like a knee-jerk reaction. They say, but what about the China study? And uh, so I analyzed the China study in this book, and again, the China study, first of all, it was a very poorly done study based on one day of food questionnaires in these remote villages, but um, I probably am one of the few people in the world who's actually seen the data. Believe it or not, you cannot get this data online. Mm. It's not anywhere online, but I've gone down to the library and seen the data. It's published in a book that's really big, and it's very hard to copy this mm -hmm. data, <laughs> mm -hmm. but I have copied it and went over it with Mary Ennig and we didn't find that anything he was saying about that study was true. <laughs> there was no correlation, no positive correlation with diets that had more plant foods. And there were, there were positive correlations with diets from, say, northern China where they ate a lot of dairy. They, those people were healthier. Exactly. I saw, yeah, the Tuali province, they ate the most meat and they were the most healthy. And then yeah. they conveniently leave the stuff out. Right. And, yeah. And, and, and the questions they ask on these food questionnaires were terrible. I mean, they weren't asking what kind of fat did you, do you cook in? We're just doing fat. So yeah. uh, were they cooking in canola oil or were they cooking in lard? Oh, you exactly. know, the traditional fat in China is lard or duck fat.
Yeah, they would have opposite results. If you're yeah. cooking in yeah. vegetable oils, you're doing even worse damage and right. oxidizing. And yeah, so it was a very, very poorly done study. Yeah, well, I have the book in the mail, actually. It's coming. I ordered it on Amazon. <laughs> I can't oh, wait. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, so the tagline is our ancestral diets, what they really ate, right? What are, what are these yes. real diets? Yes, and it's, it's surprising now. I, again, you know, uh, people always say, Sally, you figure out how to f- offend almost everybody. So I've also um, kind of taken the pot shot at the paleo diet because mm. they insist that there were no grains in traditional diets until very recently. And this is just absolutely not true. My first chapter is on the Aboriginal people of Australia. Now, these are people who had no metal, no wheels, no domestic animals. And yet they cultivated huge acres, huge areas of grain. The early settlers described fields of millet that stretched for a thousand acres. And mm-hmm. these were all, it was all done with, with the digging tools and stone knives. They harvested the grains, they winnowed the grains, they ground the grains, they soaked the grains, and they made cakes with the grains. So, and this is what you might call a, a Paleolithic people. So, again, yeah. we find all over the world, in the temperate regions, they used grains. The only places they didn't use grains were in the Arctic or in the South Seas. But in the South Seas, they had a high-carb diet because they ate sweet potatoes or yams, which were cultivated in huge fields. And uh, there's really no culture that you can point to except the Inuit culture in the north that weren't farmers. Yeah. They were all farmers. Yeah. yeah, no, I like this. I always want to find out the truth and how different things work. And it's not, I'm not a, a anti car person or, you know, the thing is these cultures did the grains properly. Yes. Right? They yes. Talk about the, the actual, so I learned about this recently too. Yeah. I thought, you know, paleo was one thing. And then as I learned more about it, I realized there's a lot more to it. And yeah. but if you soak the grains, you actually can get rid of the toxins. Yeah. So grains are very hard to digest. They're designed to be hard to digest. You know, um, a lot of animals, the grains just go right through them. A bird has a special tool uh, called the crop that actually grinds the grains like a grinder. It's got rocks in there to grind the grains. And the ruminant animal has four stomachs, which can digest, you know, uh, these grains. The human being has a simple stomach. And if we eat a lot of rough whole grains, we're going to get sick because mm-hmm. they block minerals, they block enzymes, they're irritating. And this is exactly what's happened. You know, it all started with diet for a small planet, and yes. everyone started eating a lot of whole grains. Grains are supposed to be good for you. And what have we ended up with? We've ended up with an epidemic of gluten intolerance and grain intolerance and leaky gut and bowel, irritable bowel syndrome because our digestive system just is not designed to deal with grains. However, traditional cultures understood, it's kind of amazing they understood this, but that the grains needed to be fermented, uh, soaked, whatever, before oh, yeah. you ate yeah. them. So they had, you had to be a process of pre-digestion. And in many cultures, uh, the absolute champions of this are the Africans because they make these really sour porridges and beers with the grains. And these are definitely an acquired taste, these mm-hmm. porridges and beers. Yeah. <laughs> they kind of smell like barf, but, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's how they ate, the, ate their grains. And when you do that to the grains, they become extremely nutritious. You neutralize all the anti-nutrients, you liberate the minerals, and you create a whole bunch of B vitamins, even vitamin C, even, and vitamin K as well, by the proper preparation of grains. Yeah, that was so interesting to me that I didn't know any of this. So there's a huge difference. I just want people to know there's a huge difference than any grains that you can buy in a store I mean properly done grains. And I just spent time with Dr. Bill Schindler, who has a food lab near you in Maryland. Yeah. And he showed us how to do this and, and taught us about all this stuff. And yeah. so if you can't, I mean, I still, I personally don't, you know, promote eating a lot of grains anyway. I mean, I don't know if people have time to properly prepare them, but I just want to let people know that there is a a way to eat them that can be healthy. It's healthy. So just for example, and it's actually not hard. So oatmeal. Now, I used to think I was allergic to oatmeal. If I ate oatmeal, I would actually collapse with a kind of toxic shock about Mm mid-morning. I'd be uh, shivery and break out in a sweat and, you know, run to the bathroom and, and have a terrible headache. 
Uh, once I learned to soak my oats, and it only takes a minute, you put them in warm water and a teaspoon of, or a tablespoon of vinegar the night before, soak them overnight, and then you cook them. And I don't have that problem at all. Mm. So, as you know, it just completely went away. And then I'm very careful to buy only genuine sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. And I have just no problem with that. Yeah, it's a huge difference. So if people, yeah, if you want to eat those foods and just make sure you're doing them properly. And yeah, yeah I like that. The Western price, it's, yeah, you said there's no off-limits foods. It's just how you prepare right. them, right? We, yeah, we like to call ourselves the wet, yes, you can diet. There's no major foods that's excluded from our diet because traditional cultures ate all these foods. So dairy is not excluded. It just needs to be raw, whole from pastured animals. Uh, grains are not excluded. You just need to prepare them properly. Animal foods are not excluded. Uh, you just need to make sure you eat your animal foods with fat and to eat some organ meats as well as the muscle meats. So nothing's excluded from our diet. Um, even and We don't even exclude uh, desserts. It just needs to use natural sweeteners and eat them in moderation. Uh, so there's, we like to say there's no renunciation on the Western Price diet, on the Wise Traditions diet. Yeah, I like it. It's just the, just a really modern food. Anything, the packaged stuff, it's just the refined. Yeah, product. that's what you're going to leave out. But believe me, when you start eating this way uh, and give yourself permission to put butter on everything <laughs> and to use salt, you're allowed salt on our diet, I promise you, you won't have these cravings for all this awful processed food. Yes. If you're but the food that we do eat it has to be satisfying it has to taste good has to fill us up has to make us feel good yeah that's rule number one is is being satisfied because if not then it's some crash diet that you're gonna not stick to right and, and off i say that people try to eat the puritanical diet you know the low fat high fiber no salt plant-based diet and they uh, might feel better at first but eventually they develop cravings and so then they go and eat the pornographic foods they go from the puritanical diet to the pornographic foods and we're teaching something completely different, which is just good, satisfying, wholesome, real foods of our ancestors. I love that. Yeah, that's all I'm about. And Bill Schindler put it so nicely. It says all the technologies of the past were about increasing the nutrient density of food. Exactly. And now all the, the modern technology of processing is decreasing the nutrient density of food. Exactly. Adding in. That's exactly And right. yeah, I should say that Weston Price, so he found, you know, we talked about the commonalities they all had and what he didn't find was the refined sugar, flour, yes. vegetable yes. oil. And there were no vegetarian or vegan diets. Absolutely. <laughs> love I love that point. And then I want to hit quickly back on tooth health because you said brushing your teeth and that I, that's so surprising and not a lot of people know that, but Price found that a lot of these cultures didn't brush their teeth, but they had perfect no, teeth and it's not had perfect yeah. teeth. The children in Switzerland who had perfect teeth, their teeth were covered with green slime. Yeah, but they didn't even get <laughs> off the visible tartar. Well, they didn't have tartar. Or, you know, what's just, the word? Yeah, yeah, just food. There was food. on. Yeah, it's just the, the, you know, kind of slime. But now some cultures did kind of clean their teeth with, with little twigs mm -hmm. you know they ran little twigs over their teeth but um they were not using toothpaste and toothbrushes they didn't have fluoridated water you know they didn't have sealants on their teeth they just ate the proper diet yeah i'm not and believe me i'm not telling people not to brush their yeah, teeth. yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we're just saying i think you yeah just saying that we're just saying that don't think that's going to prevent tooth decay because it's not it's not what it's about what prevents tooth decay is having a lot of vitamin k in your saliva while you're eating a nutrient-dense diet that provides vitamins a d k calcium and phosphorus and there may be other things too that you need but those are the five main ones i absolutely agree the only time i ever had cavities my whole life was when i was in college eating the worst diet the yeah, worst diet exactly. possible and i was still brushing my teeth yeah. the entire life yeah. you know the yeah. only difference was my horrible cheap college diet and then yeah. can you tell us about quickly about the jaw because just how does a jaw form i mean to have the wide dental arches and how does that even work because people don't really believe that just eating nutrient dense foods yeah. can actually change the shape of your face yeah well it can determine the shape of your face if, if this starts before pregnancy and in pregnancy and through the growth period so the maxilla, which is the upper jaw bone, is the critical bone here, and it's actually the first bone to be affected by poor nutrition. If you have the kind of nutrition that builds good, strong bones, that maxilla will be wide, and that determines the, the high cheekbones and the wide face mm -hmm. and the, the shape of the upper palate. And then the second bone to be affected is the, max, the mandible, which is the lower jaw bone, and that determines the shape of the lower palate and the width of the jaw. 
So these are all determined uh, in early, early in life. Yeah, so I thought that's so interesting that it can really change. And, and we've just seen it time and time again. And I, I can tell you in my own family, I needed braces, orthodontics, um, and all my, brother, my brothers did and my sister did. We all needed braces. My parents both had perfect teeth. All four of us needed braces. Mm. Now, in my own children, not one of them needed braces. Wow. Because I, I changed my diet. Yeah. And I have four grandchildren. It doesn't look like they're going to need braces either, it, with the possible exception of the oldest grandchild, because my, fa- my daughter discovered that she had a gluten intolerance when she uh, was pregnant, and so she wasn't absorbing things very well. Now, he's still a healthy smart child, but he may need a palate widening. Mm. And I blame myself for my daughter's gluten intolerance because I didn't know any better. I was, when she was a baby, I was feeding her what they told me and she got a lot of whole grains way too early in life. My boys, my later children, I waited and didn't start the grains till they were at least a year Mm. old and they're fine. They, They can eat gluten. Okay. Well, that's interesting. And then raw milk, we kind of talked about raw milk, but just there's such a campaign against raw milk. Well, that's the industry wanting to consolidate. Uh, They don't want the farmer to be able to sell directly to the public. They want to consolidate everything in these huge mega dairies and, you know, just a few processing plants and have control over the whole industry. I can't think of anything that's more wasteful than pasteurization of milk. Every single vitamin in milk is either completely destroyed or reduced And all of the enzymes that you need to absorb the minerals in the milk are all destroyed. So you've taken a product, a food that is extremely nourishing, that we absorb 100% of the vitamins and minerals because of these enzymes, and that builds a healthy immune system. And once you pasteurize, you have basically taken away the nutrition and you've created a food that's highly allergenic. And so fewer and fewer people can even consume pasteurized milk. The market for pasteurized milk is actually declining at yeah. one to three percent per year. People, people, people can't man, you know, tolerate this stuff because they're not doing it right. Yeah, people have such a problem with milk. They make all these arguments. Oh, we, we're not supposed to have it. We only had it, you know, eight thousand years ago, and it's not. Yeah. And they say, well, raw milk is inherently unsafe. It's going to kill you, and and just nothing can be further from the truth. Uh, we've checked all the records going back to the nineteen sixties. There's never been a single death from raw milk, and there have been lots of deaths from pasteurized milk. Raw milk contains components that actually kill pathogens, and as long as it's produced in um, clean conditions, which is easy to do today, uh, there is just no problem with the raw milk. Pasteurization is completely unnecessary. Yeah, I believe that. And I love that all this Weston Price stuff is coming back in fashion. It's funny because everyone <laughs> thinks it's... I do too. Yeah. yeah, I think it's wonderful. It's like bone broth. Oh, yeah. it's so cool these days. Or like yeah. all this stuff. And the fermented foods. We didn't talk about oh. fermented foods. But yeah. again, there's something else that's so important. And we didn't really even know this 20 years ago that we needed these live, I call them super raw foods that are fermented, things like raw sauerkraut to uh, put the good gut bacteria into our systems. And that's another big theme at Weston Price. Yes, I love that. And that's what uh, I was just doing with Bill Schindler, too, was showing kimchi and sauerkraut and yeah. all these things. And, and that's coming back in fashion, too. Everyone's talking about, oh, yeah, I got to yeah. get your kimchi. And-, and what's really neat about all these things is that they can be produced by small artisan producers. Yeah. You know, you don't need a lot of capital to start doing sauerkraut to make bone broth, to make sourdough bread, you know, all these wonderful things that, and to, and to do raw milk either. So I really look forward to seeing a food culture that is supported by millions of artisan producers and not just a few big corporations. I Yeah, I would love to see that. And I told you while we were walking around the farm that there's a chance we may be heading this way because a new generation likes this independence and I'm going to drive yes. for Uber. I'm going to, you know, do my own thing, not yeah. work for the man. Yes. People want to work from home, you know, and a lot more people can because of modern technology. So we kind of went through a dark period with technology where it took us away from our roots, our traditions, our good food, even our happiness. But now we've come to the point where technology um, actually allows us to have these things again. Yeah. And I think the future is smaller operations, small farms, yes. small, yeah. small people doing things. And then the technology can allow people to find them and access them. Like, yes. Where do I get my raw Yes. Milk? And again, so we set up uh, realmilk.com in 1998. 
a website to help people find raw milk. And it gets around the laws that make it illegal for farmers to advertise raw milk. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not advertising because they're not paying us. We just tell people mm -hmm. where the raw milk is. And it's resulted in this explosive growth of raw milk. People can find it. They know where it is. So again, we see modern technology is actually helping to bring back this wonderful traditional food. Absolutely. And you can go to westonaprice.org and become a member. I became a member recently. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, members, you go to westonaprice.org and if you become a member, you uh, get our quarterly journal. But even if you just want to get to know us, sign up to get the seven email lessons. They're just seven very short lessons about traditional foods. Yeah, that's a great starting point. And there's local chapters. They have events, yeah. they have support for people, information. And I love it. It's just funny that all this stuff is coming back in fashion now. And you and yeah. the organization and Price in general, it's like, yeah, we've known this all along. <laughs> this is yeah, it's like we've been in Kansas all yeah, along. <laughs> this is how we're supposed to live. It's so obvious. Yeah, right. Like, why would it be any different? It's just this is how humans yeah. live. Right. And awesome. Thank you so much. And I, I'll let you go now. Well, well, thank you for having me. And best of luck with your movie. It's so it's such an exciting project. And as soon as you can get us a review copy, we will definitely and review it and might be something we could show at our conference too that would be amazing yeah. thank you so much thanks for having me just wanted to add in that her husband jeffrey is 92 and is still crushing hands and riding tractors nutrient density is king we're going to take a little time off for the holidays and be back for season three with dr ryan lowry and his response to lane norton as well as the great benefits of being fat adapted Support us on Indiegogo and pre-order the film. You can still get all the great rewards we are offering. Give this podcast a review if you could. Share it with a friend. Say hi on social media and have a good holiday break. Bye.